Welcome to Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our website is libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today we are talking with Ted Frank about class action abuses. Ted Frank is a lawyer and the founder and president of the Center for Class Action Fairness, where he has won landmark cases and millions of dollars for consumers who have been a part of unfair class action settlements. He is also an adjunct fellow at the Center for Legal Policy at the Manhattan Institute. Ted, I'm glad to discuss this with you. Happy to be here. Great. I want to ask you at the beginning, uh, now with uh, class action uh, settlement abuses, uh, you've certainly uh, made this a huge part of, of what you do. But where is the system now? I mean, with, with class action settlements, what's, what's going on legally? You write about um, uh, two cases, AT&T Mobility versus Conception, and then a recent case in February, which the court, Supreme Court ho- heard oral arguments on American Express versus the Italian Colors Restaurant. It seems, you know, from my read, that arbitration, uh, mandatory arbitration clauses and contracts seems to be the biggest challenge to the current practice of class action. Well, certainly uh, potential corporate defendants have an incentive to shift their dispute resolution with their customers into mandatory arbitration because the class action system is so expensive uh, and because the class action system, uh, as it is currently structured, uh, though it's, it's, it's getting better, but as it is currently structured, most of the expense of the class action system goes to lawyers rather than to compensating potentially injured consumers. So when a vendor can switch to a mandatory arbitration clause or, or have, its cons- have its customers agree to mandatory arbitration, it can pass the savings along to the customers if it's operating in a competitive market where it's competing against other vendors who have other dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, and to the extent that courts permit this freedom of contract, consumers will be better off, uh, the vendors will be better off, and uh, that will come at the expense of trial lawyers. So arbitration uh, has really emerged uh, as a, uh, a key practice. So, and you, you write a lot about this in, uh, in a recent uh, white paper for the Manhattan Institute, which is available uh, at their website, Class Actions, Arbitration, and Consumer Rights. So it, it, it seems, I mean, what, what the issue it, that this raises, uh, the, the success of arbitration, the ease uh, that it seems on average to benefit consumers more is, you know, what's really uh, in the best interest of consumers? Uh, or has the class action system itself turned into uh, not a means uh, for consumer right vindication, but actually to end itself of, of actually, I, I don't know, I was just thinking of you know, being tied into social justice or corporate fairness or, or hemming in corporations and you know, trying to extract another rent from them? Well, I, I mean, that, that's multiple questions. So what, what, what's happening is when, when a consumer has a dispute with a, a, a large corporation over a relatively small amount of money, how do you resolve that dispute? And, you know, you can certainly do it outside the justice system entirely. You call up customer service, and customer service either resolves it or they don't resolve it. Uh, but if, if the consumer has a cause of action where they're entitled to uh, vindicate it through the legal system, how can they best do that? Uh, and if, if the claim is small enough, you're not going to be able to hire a lawyer. I'm not going to be able to hire a lawyer because I've had a $5 dispute with, with my phone company. And no lawyer is going to take that case in a manner that will allow me to recover my $5 and, and come out ahead because they'll charge me far more than $5, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, to, 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 to take that case to court. I mean, even the filing fees alone would, be, um, at, would strip that, outstrip that money. But the class action system allows plaintiffs to aggregate claims into a single proceeding. So if there are a million people who have been similarly ripped off $5, now it becomes economic to bring the case into court and say, look, we have a million customers with identical $5 claims. Please hear our case for $5 million. And and now the lawyers uh, have uh, the incentive, or at least 
it, it makes economic and social sense uh, to hire attorneys to do that if the class action system is working um, and if the, the the system is working uh, as it should you, you you litigate the case for a few hundred thousand dollars you decide whether or not there, there's five million dollars uh, of damage to the consumers and, and then you pay the consumers five million dollars when when the lawyers prevail uh, the what has happened however is that uh, people bring class actions regardless of the underlying merits of the case and simply threaten uh, to expose the defendant to large legal expenses and then negotiate a settlement where it's not so much the consumers that are being paid but the lawyers that are being paid. Uh, and when that's happening, it's, it, it's just pure rent-seeking at that point. Uh, there, 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 there's no um, deterrence for bad actions for corporations because the good corporations are getting sued just as often as the bad corporations are. Uh, the settlements are being based on the expense of getting rid of the case rather than on the damages to the consumers. Uh, and if courts are not um, uh, living up to their oversight obligations on the fairness of settlements, the settlements can completely sidestep the, the, the putative class members, the p people who were supposedly had the injury in the first place, and merely compensate the attorneys, uh, which in turn incentivizes them to keep bringing actions where consumers aren't actually going to realize any benefit. Um, so it's that expense that corporations are attempting to sidestep with mandatory arbitration proceedings. And Consumers actually do do better in, in mandatory, an individual consumer at least, will actually do better uh, in a mandatory arbitration than proceeding within the litigation system, both as a defendant, say, if, if, the, if the vendor or the credit card company or what have you is, is attempting to engage in a collection action. Uh, in collection actions, consumers do much better in arbitration than they do in the court system, which very quickly uh, will resolve these things uh, through default judgments and whatnot, whereas in arbitration there are procedural protections for consumers who don't show up to the proceedings. The, the, those protections are largely absent in, in the uh, in the court system, in the small claim system, or, or what have you. Um, but more importantly, uh, because the mandatory arbitration system allows a vendor to avoid the expenses of a class action system that normally won't act, do anything to compensate the consumer, uh, the, the vendor now has the opportunity to pass the savings along to consumers, and the only people who lose out are the people who profited from the class action system, which would be the lawyers. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions uh, just coming out of your remarks. So, I mean, and this is a basic question. Um, I mean, how does a plaintiff lawyer interact with the class uh, itself? Uh, and, Certainly. And, and the members. I mean, I, that was one thing I had. And, um, you know, a second question is just thinking about these large settlements. So I, I take it in reading a lot of your uh, uh, writing and advocacy on this subject that, there really is nothing like a model or a blueprint, it seems, uh, that is used in how you know, one constructs the size and then, uh, I suppose, how it's allocated. Uh, and, and I don't know if it was something like, say, personal injury, where typically these contingent fee attorneys take like 30% or something, if there's any sort of notion like that, or, or maybe, you know, thinking like in family law settlements or something. But uh, so, yeah, those are two questions I had. Uh, and, and then I, I want to get into kind of what I take it to be the kind of the major procedural revolution in this, which is the 1966 uh, uh, opt-out as the default rule for, for members of a class. Right. And, and the opt-out rule is, 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 has very much to do with how attorneys interact with the class. Uh, okay. uh, when an attorney brings a putative class action, uh, what he or she will have, he will have a single client or maybe a few clients or maybe even a dozen clients who he says are representative of the claims of the class as a whole, uh, that the, the claims are similarly situated, that there are common elements uh, across the board between his clients and what the rest of the class has. 
and asks to represent asks for these class members to represent a, a, a class as a whole. And if the court agrees with that, uh, either through a formal class certification process or uh, for purposes of settlement, uh, then class members, people who are in this putative class, are in the class unless they affirmatively choose to opt out. That is how the American system is, operates. You don't sign up to be in a class action. Uh, a court decides that you are in a class action, and you have to take the affirmative step to opt out of the class action. Which few uh, do. Which few do, and, yeah. and that makes all the sense in the world, because yeah. just as it's, it's a very small claim that do, it doesn't pay to bring the case in the first case, place, it, it doesn't pay to opt out for most people. If you have a $5 claim and you think your lawyers have not fairly treated you in that $5 claim, well, opting out isn't going to do you any good because you still don't have the, the, um, the wherewithal to bring your $5 claim on your own. Uh, so you, you, it doesn't pay for you to spend the $0.44 cents on a stamp and sometimes even more than that to, to, to go forward and opt out. Uh, similarly, it doesn't pay for you to, to object. That, that's time-consuming to read and understand the settlement, decide whether or not it, it's a fair allocation of, of uh, the, the proceeds to you relative to the attorney, uh, and, and decide whether you're being fairly treated, and then try to communicate that to a judge who uh, may then just decide to ignore you because you haven't formatted it in the appropriate legal way, or you haven't made the, the right legal arguments, or you haven't referenced uh, the, the, the right precedents to demonstrate that you're being treated unfairly. And of course, the parties have an incentive to structure a settlement in a way that confuses both the class members and the judge, uh, because what you, consider the competing incentives. The attorneys for the class are trying to maximize their own recovery, how much they get in the way of fees, while the defendant is trying to minimize the amount that they're paying to get rid of all of these claims. Uh, who's not at the table? It's the absent class members, the millions of people who are being putatively represented by the attorneys who at the same time are negotiating their own payment. Um, now, this still has to be approved by a judge, so you can't be blatant about it. You can't say, okay, here's a $20 million fund to settle the case, and the lawyers are going to take $19 million of that. The judge might question that. He'll say, why are the lawyers getting $19 million and the class members getting a $1 million? So what the parties will do is that they will do things that create the illusion of relief for the class while permitting the attorneys to collect what they would collect before, while permitting the defendant to get rid of the case at the lower price that they would have before. So instead of saying, here's a $20 million cash settlement, they'll say, we're going to give out coupons to the class members. And, and, and each of these coupons has a $10 face value, and we're going to give out $10 million of these coupons. Um, and uh, th that, that's worth $100 million. So now that the attorneys are asking for $20 million, that seems a reasonably proportionate amount. And what everybody, what the tacit collusion there is, is that the coupons will have limitations. You won't be able to combine them with other coupons. They'll be, they'll be for higher priced items that you wouldn't have bought otherwise. Uh, there'll, there'll be restrictions on how they can be used or transferred. Uh, and typically, only 1% to 3% of coupons will get redeemed. And if it's a poor coupon settlement, uh, where only 1% of them are going to get redeemed, then the real cost of the defendant is a million dollars, and the attorneys are walking away with the $20 million that they said they would. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't have to be a coupon settlement. There are many, many, many other ways that the parties can create the illusion of relief without creating actual relief. Uh, and if the courts are not performing their oversight function, and they're not looking into whether or not the class is actually benefiting from the class action, then the attorneys can capture the vast majority of the value of the settlement versus what the defendant is willing to pay out. Now, I take it in your work, you must be really popular with trial lawyers, given that you're actually challenging their paydays, uh, and in certain cases winning. Am I right? Or 
Yes, let me step back. Okay. And uh, <laughs> what I run is a nonprofit called the Center for Class Action Fairness, and we represent class members who are confronted with unfair settlements. Yeah. As I mentioned before, nobody has the incentive to pay a lawyer to come in and say, wait a second, I had a $5 claim here, and the settlement pays me $1, and it should have paid me 2 or $3 because the attorneys are getting so much money. You can't hire a lawyer to do that. It doesn't pay for you to hire a lawyer to do that. It probably doesn't even pay for you to figure out how bad the settlement is uh, because, as I said before, the parties are going to do things to hide uh, what it is that, that the class is actually getting versus what it is the attorneys are getting. Uh, so we fill that gap. Um, Class members have the right to object to the fairness of a settlement before the court approves it at a fairness hearing. And we represent consumers at that fairness hearing, and we go in and we deconstruct the settlement. We figure out what it is that the class is actually getting. We compare that to what the attorneys are actually getting. And if there's disproportion there, we point that out to the court and we argue that the law does not permit such disproportions and that the court actually has to um, value the actual relief to the class. And that will make us unpopular with the plaintiff's lawyers, surely, because we're potentially taking bread out of their mouth, because we're pointing out that they're taking money out of the pockets of their clients. Um, We'll also, uh, (laughs) at times, get the defendants angry because they thought that they had this case settled and 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 here we are uh, potentially creating uh, a a problem for them in this particular individual settlement uh, and the general counsel will have to go to his executives and say this class action hasn't gone away yet because the court rejected our settlement so we we've had some defendants get angry at us too and then we can even have the judge get angry at us <clears throat> because Class actions are complicated things. The, the 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 judge might have been dealing with these attorneys for years, uh, and for us to come in and point out that the class isn't actually benefiting from the settlement, and that this big complicated case that's taking up a lot of the judge's time might not go away from her docket if she doesn't if if she does her job right and disapproves the settlement, that can get a judge unhappy at us too. Uh, so we're, we're, we're sometimes, um, uh, very alone in that room, in that room at the fairness hearing, um, and have had to have appellate court step in to create the, to, 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 to reestablish the principles that the class is supposed to be the primary beneficiary of any class action settlement. I want to, uh, do you find in your work, are state courts and federal courts more, attuned now to the problems that you discussed, the structural problems uh, with class action settlements um, uh, and, you know, and, and the, you know, the three different capacities you, you mentioned here. Uh, and also, I was just thinking, you know, so there's a lot of literature on the tort tax and what it costs corporations to do business, given uh, you know, frequent lawsuits. What, what, is there any sort of, sort of uh, recognition out there of what the class action system does uh, and the economic harm uh, or inefficiencies uh, uh, that it causes, that it leads to. Um, and, and also, I just I keep going back and thinking, do you find there to be something unjust itself in the very idea of class action? Uh, or do you think that's just the initial idea uh, uh, owing to the change in 1938 and the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure? Do you find that to be just a reasonable response to you know, a massifying industrial society? Well, those are three completely different questions on three completely different subjects. So let me take the first one first, and you can decide where we want to follow up next. Um, When I started this in 2009, I think think where we are in 2013 versus 2009, there is an increased recognition by courts of the conflict of interest problem in the class action settlement procedure. And, and courts are, are being much more careful about that now. I don't think okay. we're all the way there yet, um, but I think we, the Center for Class Action Fairness has served as, as sort of a traffic cop that has, one, created the precedents uh, in the appellate courts that the district courts are supposed to follow, uh, but two, um, we, we, the parties are now sort of negotiating in the shadow of the threat of Ted Frank coming in and busting up their settlements if they don't do it right. 
Uh, so we're, we're seeing better settlements now in 2013 than we were seeing in 2009. When we first started this in 2009, a lot of courts would just sort of, a lot of district courts would just sort of look at us uncomprehendingly and say, but the parties have agreed to a settlement here. How can you say that it's unfair? Um, they, they agreed to this, and this, this recovery for the class isn't unfair because the, the parties agreed to it, and the attorney's fees aren't unfair because the parties agreed to it, and they didn't, never made the connection party that wasn't at the table. They were treating it like a, a regular settlement and, and not paying attention to the conflict of interest problem, not paying attention to the self-dealing problem. So we would see a lot of rubber stamps of settlements without any real thought going into things. Um, and we had to take those up on appeal, and we would win these cases on appeal. We would have a court come in and say, when there's a disproportion, there's a potential unfairness because there's potential self-dealing. When the attorneys are doing things to disguise, to, to, to protect their fee request from scrutiny, that's a sign of self-dealing. Um, and we, we, this February, we won a very important case where, um, in, in a case called In Ray Baby Products Antitrust Litigation, uh, and there it was, it was an antitrust case against Babies R Us uh, and, and a lot of vendors that they worked with alleging uh, resale price maintenance against the antitrust laws. Uh, and that case ultimately settled for, 35, for, for a settlement fund of $35.5 million, of which the attorneys were going to ask for $14 million of it. Huh. Uh, and class members could make claims for recovery um, against the settlement fund, but to do that, they would have to fill out a five-page claim form. And if they didn't have their receipt at hand for a four-year-old, six-year-old, eight-year-old product, uh, they could only claim $5. So naturally, very few class members actually made claims on the claim fund, and only $3 million was going to get distributed to the class. Um, we objected to the district court that there, there was this problem that the, the claims process was set up so that class members would never get any money, and all the money would end up going to what's called Cypre, which is um, sort of a misnomer for a situation where instead of money going to the class, it's going to third-party charities picked by the attorneys. Um, and, and so the attorneys would sort of benefit twice. They would get their $14 million as their fees, and then they would get sort of a slush fund to give to their favorite charities instead of giving to their clients. And now, when, you know judges can even influence that decision, am I right, in, in the Cypre uh, context? It, it, it varies from settlement to okay, settlement. Yeah. Some, some, some settlements give the discretion up to the judges, which I view as, as extraordinarily unethical. I, 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 I mean, this is, this is an entirely separate problem from the one we're discussing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... It, in this case, it was going to be the lawyers who were going to pick it. And, and that creates yet another conflict of interest because now, you know, you're the lawyer of this case. The judge is going to award you your attorney's fees because you won, quote, unquote, $35 million, whether or not that money goes to the class members or to your favorite charity. And are, are you going to care that $5, you know, do you, do you want $5 to go to a class member who doesn't know who you are and isn't going to be very grateful? Or do you want to be able to stand at a big charitable function with a big oversized check and, and give as much money as you can to a charity that is, is, is going to sing hosannas to you? Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of conflict of interest means that nobody has the incentive to make sure that the class members actually get paid. And indeed, the district court wouldn't even follow up with our request. Can you figure out what the class is getting paid here and, and take that into account when you're judge adjudicating the fairness of the settlement? Um, and we didn't learn until we got up to um, the Third Circuit in Philadelphia and the, the Federal Appeals Court that the class only got $3 million versus $14 million for the attorneys. Um, and so this wasn't really a $35 million settlement. It was a $3 million settlement. And the attorneys were going to get almost five times as much as the class, maybe even more than five times as much as the class, because it might have been less than $3 million. Um, <laughs> and on, on top of getting to sort of reallocate 
the, the, the check. And, and so we got a very important ruling from the appeals court that said, you have to consider what it is the class is actually getting, a settlement where $3 million goes to the class and $18 million goes to charity. It just simply isn't as good as a, class, uh, as, as a settlement where it's the other way around. And you have to take that into account, both in adjudicating the fairness of the settlement and in adjudicating the attorney's fees. I was going to ask you on the, on the Cypre settlements, I uh, just thinking, is that, is that um, a high percentage uh, device that's used uh, to distribute uh, settlement funds? I mean, I, I guess at one level I was thinking it is, but I, I didn't know. And you know, also, you, you list some kind of uh, interesting uh, uses of the money, which I, I, and I was thinking of Walter Olson's book. On, uh, on law schools and the interaction uh, with, with legal, with professional lawyers and kind of the contracts that go both ways and then naming rights, a uh, certain sense of trial lawyers having law schools named after them or endowed chairs and things. And this actually, you notice and you, you note in certain Cypress settlements that, uh, you know, actually even judges uh, have given money to their alma maters uh, coming out of settlements, which I guess maybe that's a minority case, but uh, seemed uh, interesting. And then also just think about the power uh, that one has in those in that context, right? And 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 Cypre has has especially with the Class Action Fairness Act in place, uh, the parties have sort of one of the ways that parties have sort of tried to create the illusion of relief, justifying the high attorneys' fees without actually making the defendant pay anything that they don't want to pay, is is through the Cypre system, uh, which. Cypre comes from uh, a, a French term, Cypre con possible, uh, which was applied in the trust context. You have a trust, say, it's the 19th century, and you have a trust to abolish slavery in the United States, uh, and the Emancipation Proclamation and, 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 and the Constitution is amended, and there's no more slavery in the United States. What do you do with the trust money? Um, you could petition uh, the the trustee could petition to the court to change the purpose of the trust to something as near as possible to uh what the original trust intent was uh and and that's that's a very um solid doctrine in, in the law of trusts and it was getting manipulated to apply to class actions oh we have a bunch of money here that we don't want to actually distribute to the class. Let's give it to the next best possible use. Um, but sometimes the next best possible use is something that the attorney wanted to do anyway, or uh, something that the defendant was giving money to anyway. So it's just really a change in accounting entries rather than a, a punishment or, or a, a, a new set of relief uh, for the benefit of the class, or sometimes it's it's a slush fund for the judge, and the judge gives money to a school where he's teaching or to the Animal Rights uh, Defense League. Uh, in the case of a judge proceeding over, uh, presiding over a uh, Puerto Rico hotel fire class action, what animal rights has to do with hotel fires, I don't know, but the, the judge liked that charity. Um, so you have this multitude of conflicts of interest where the Cypre is actually benefiting somebody other than the class, but it's also a way to sort of exaggerate attorney's fees and ensure that the attorneys capture the majority of the relief because uh -huh. uh, a, a defendant is, might be happier giving money to charity that they can take credit for, or it's a charity they've worked with in the past, or... Uh, in the case um, that we'll be taking to the Supreme Court shortly, Lane versus Facebook, uh, the charity was actually controlled by Facebook. It was a Facebook lobbyist who was the head of the board of the charity, uh, and it was a brand new charity established by Facebook to sort of promote Facebook interests. Uh, and, and the attorneys would get millions of dollars for having Facebook create a charity. Now, Facebook already gives a lot of money to charity, and, and so this was really a change in accounting entries. Uh, the class wasn't getting anything that they wouldn't have gotten anyway. This wasn't new money going to charity. Interesting there. I, I guess as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking um, this, uh, another argument for class actions that, that you note is that they are a deterrent uh, threat uh, to the corporations. I guess it would be one way in which it's really not a deterrent 
Um, but yeah, there's a, you, know, you, you mentioned um, you know, the, the objective for the incentive for a, a, a plaintiff lawyer is you know, to bring cases uh, that maybe aren't, uh, maybe aren't uh, the most painful to a corporation, but just to get a settlement, uh, just to actually get their pay to. So actually we're dealing with something extraordinarily inefficient here uh, in terms of the overall operation uh, and it not actually being a deterrent uh, you know, given certain incentives. Um, I, and I wanted to just kind of go back to another question, and I apologize uh, earlier for asking you three separate questions. But I was thinking, what's, you know, what's kind of the overall economic effect of class actions? Well, it, it, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, yeah. it, 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 because, the, and here the deterrence effect ratchets into it. Mm-hmm. Um, if class actions have a deterrence effect, and, and they're preventing fraud, and, and they're preventing uh, bad treatment of consumers or, or securities fraud or um, other things that they're used for, um, then, you know, they, 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 they have a positive effect and, and it might be, you know, the, the, the benefits might very well outweigh the costs. And there are certainly very good class actions that are brought against uh, uh, on behalf of consumers with legitimate grievances and, and, and mm-hmm. Sometimes wrongdoers actually end up having to pay class members a, a, a real and legitimate recovery, and the attorneys should recover accordingly when, when they, they achieve those results. The problem with the class action system uh, is that, to a great extent, the deterrence effect is masked because the good corporations are getting sued just as often as the bad corporations. People are not being sued because they've done something wrong. People are being sued because they're in deep pocket. Uh, and um, mm-hmm. y- you can have a cor- – or even if a corporation has, has done something wrong, they might have fixed it uh, outside of the class action system, but there, there's sort of a, 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 a follow-up okay. class action anyway uh, to try to attempt to extract fees. Uh, and – to the extent these class actions are permitted to be settled without actually benefiting consumers, then it's, it just becomes a tax. It, 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 it's not actually a deterrent. It's, it's a tax on, on, on just producing things, uh, selling things, uh, participating in the, in the public securities market. And to that extent, uh, it, 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 it's just pure social cost. It's, it's a wealth transfer from consumers and shareholders to uh, plaintiffs and defense lawyers. Um, okay. So, yeah. so I, I, at the margin, I think we have a problem. I think we have more class actions than are socially optimal, and we can do that because it's, it's very profitable to bring us class action even if it doesn't have a lot of merit. And courts need to throw out more non-meritorious class actions uh, to preclude that sort of profit. And then if a case settles for a nuisance settlement, reflecting the, the, the fact that the, the case is unlikely to succeed, uh, but it's cheaper to pay the attorneys than to go away, then the courts need to ensure that the consumers are, are actually getting the lion's share of the benefits and that the attorneys aren't simply uh, being compensated without actually accomplishing anything for the class. Um, and we just won a case this week in Ray HP Inkjet, which I think demonstrates this issue. Uh, it, it was basically a case that the plaintiff's attorneys had lost. Uh, they had the case up on appeal, and the defendant, Hewlett Packard, said, okay, we, 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 we'll create a settlement to just to get rid of all this litigation so that we don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to preserve our victory on appeal and, 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 and just this overhang is, a, is, is away from us. And again, it's going to be a coupon settlement, but the coupons have to be used at hp.com, which, by the way, charges a higher price than amazon.com and other vendors, and they're only going to be for a few dollars, and you have to go through an elaborate claims process where you – you open up the back of your printer and figure out the serial number and enter in the serial number and and and, and do all these things to jump through hoops to get your coupons, um, and and then we'll pay the attorneys 2.9 million dollars. And as it turned out, um, 
very few coupon, only 100,000 consumers out of the tens of millions of HP uh, class members actually asked for coupons. Uh, the coupons had a face value of 1.5 million, but were clearly going to be worth much less than that because one, anybody who used a coupon was probably losing money because they were buying more expensive goods at the limited place where they could buy uh, the coupon, buy, use the coupons rather than uh, at, at cheaper vendors. Uh, but also, many coupons weren't going to get used. So basically, it was pretty worthless relief for the class. Uh, but the attorneys, even though they brought a losing case, were going to get as much as $2.9 million because that's what HP was willing to pay to settle the case. And the judge reduced that to $2.1 million. But because of the way the settlement was structured, the $800,000 returned to HP. Mm -hmm. uh, so consumers lost out a second time because the attorneys were negotiating on behalf of themselves rather than be on behalf of the class. And money that – so y y you had a settlement that was worth basically $3 million, uh, and instead of the class getting $2 million of that and the attorneys getting less than a million of that, you, you had the attorneys getting $2.1 million of that and HP getting the rest. Um, <laughs> that's great. Uh, uh, that's nice work. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, you know, where's the deterrence? Because yeah, there's no deterrence, yeah. The, 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 one, HP is paying less than they would have paid the, for the value of the case. Uh, two, the consumers aren't getting anything, so where's the benefit to consumers? And three, where's the incentives for the attorneys to bring a good case if they brought a losing case and are still getting $2 million for it? Uh, um, so... Uh, it was sort of a triple problem there. Yeah. Um, and it, it was good that we got that thrown out at the Ninth Circuit, but even one of the appellate judges, it was only a two-to-one decision, one of the appellate judges was going to be perfectly happy with attorneys getting $2 million without actually accomplishing anything for the class or bringing a meritorious case. Do you find there to be like some, is there some philosophical commitment in, in that circumstance of that judge, or is it just... You know, I, this is, I, I this think is the that, deal, this is the settlement, and, and this is what we're sticking with. I, I think that's right. Um, yeah. And, you know, it might be that this particular judge's husband is a, is a prominent class action lawyer. Um, I, I hope that's not what happened. But mm. um, yeah. y y you had a judge willing to ignore the plain language of the statute, which says you, you, you value coupons at their redemption rate. Uh, you, you at the value at which they're redeemed, and and she was willing to say, no, you can just look at the face value of the coupons, and you can ignore that part of the statute and just award the attorneys two million dollars because they build a lot of time on this, and and their time is is worth something. Uh, I just wanted to, and I was curious. Uh, I was thinking of the 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 Joinder procedure in 1938 that legitimated class actions. Was there vigorous debate at the time <clears throat> about? I, I mean, out of the, the equity or the justness of this, that it would you would actually be inviting litigation rather than trying to mitigate litigation, or of all these kind of developments and consequences that you're dealing with, uh, just kind of you know, no one foresaw that at the time, and I guess in particular the night the, the 1966 uh, innovation of the opt-out rule seems to be huge. But I, I was just I was wondering that. Yeah, I, I I think what happened was is that people were creating the 1966 rules in anticipation of civil rights litigation, and they were thinking there would maybe be a dozen class actions a year. Uh, and, 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 and if you look at sort of, it's not quite legislative history, but, but sort, sort of the, the academic history of, of the committees uh, rewriting the rules in 1966, they were anticipating we, we need a procedural device to make it easier to, to bring civil rights class actions, okay. uh, to, to, to protect against segregation, to protect against uh, discriminatory uh, rights, to protect free speech. Um, and the entrepreneurial trial bar recognized uh, how the procedural innovation could be used in the consumer context. Uh, to sort of aggregate claims and create an interorum effect against defendants that would be expensive to uh, that, that suddenly your, 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 your client with a $5 claim really has a, a, a multi-million dollar claim uh, and 
you can bring you you, you can justify very expensive litigation against a defendant uh, by virtue of um, of of this aggregation of claims, um, and yeah. you, you you saw uh, sort of the tail wagging the dog in cases like Walmart versus Dukes, where yeah. the, the the underlying uh, prerequisites for a class action weren't even met. You you had um, you know while you know hundreds of hundreds of different stores with different managers making different discretionary decisions, and 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 millions of class members. You know some of whom did get the promotions they were supposed to get. Some of whom were in stores where women were actually doing better than men. Some of whom uh, didn't get promoted because as Dukes herself had the problem with, uh, they were. Uh, they were violating a lot of internal company rules. Uh, but when you turn that into a class action, uh, suddenly the company can't defend itself. It can't bring up these individualized defenses. Uh, and, and so the class certification process could, could actually work to extinguish um, a, a, a defendant's ability to defend itself. I, was, I kind of wanted to, um, there's something that was on my mind, and uh, so maybe we can end uh, kind of where we began, and, and that's with arbitration, uh, which seems to be the most competitive, uh, correct me if I'm the most competitive challenge to class actions and you know, could, could potentially make class action lawyers really justify what they do if they want, you know, if, if say, I think you know, if the holding um, in uh, uh, the Italian Colors case uh, goes, uh, you know, the way it, uh, I, I take it it should go. Uh, just looking at the conception holding, uh, am I right uh, on, in terms of mandatory the enforceability of mandatory arbitration clauses, assuming well, they're well, fair well, to the well, consumer? Certainly, if consumers have the are, are are granted the freedom of contract to choose mandatory yeah. arbitration clauses, then they will be offered mandatory arbitration clauses as long as the class action system uh, is more expensive, uh, a dispute resolution mechanism with inferior results yeah, than, yeah. than mandatory arbitration is. They're not going to opt out and choose, I, I need to have the class action opportunity. And, and, and that, 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 that's exactly right. That's what Nobody, I'm trying to say. Yeah. You, you, you have multiple phone companies out there, and nobody is going on TV and advertising. We don't have mandatory arbitration clauses. <laughs> um, eBay... Uh, had a clever idea of making their mandatory arbitration clause opt out, which uh, so that nobody could say I was forced into this mandatory arbitration clause because then the EBA could say you weren't forced into it. It was the default to be sure, but you had the right to opt out of the mandatory arbitration clause. Uh, and but because so few consumers are actually going to choose to do that, even when it's free to do so, uh, just as so few consumers choose to opt out of an unfair class action. Yeah. Um, even with a um, sort of a lobbying campaign, advertising by public citizen and other trial lawyer friendly groups, to uh, for consumers to opt out of the the mandatory class, uh, the mandatory arbitration uh, clauses of the eBay thing. Now nobody is going to want to bring a class action against eBay because you can only bring it on behalf of the class members who haven't opted out of the mandatory arbitration, and now it become you, you don't have. And, and eBay will say, okay, we'll, we'll defend on, against the 8,000 class members now, uh, or however many have opted out. But it, it, it's no longer a potentially bankrupting thing for, for eBay to be faced with a class action. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, that reduces the sort of the leverage trial lawyers have to sort of extract wealth, fr uh, rents and wealth from, from eBay. Uh, but meanwhile, the consumers who are in the mandatory arbitration uh, clause of dispute resolution, they're still going to be able to, to resolve their disputes yeah. uh, in, in, in a manner that uh, um, uh, treats them fairly. So, uh, and I just wanted to um, you know, end with thinking about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, which you say uh, is an agency tasked with regulating mandatory arbitration clauses in financial contracts. So I was going to ask you any uh, news here, any new rules from them uh, on this front, which I, you know, I, I take it also just given their, you know, largely you know, lack of accountability. Uh, it seems to they have a broad, uh, a broad scope of power that this is something to be thinking about. 
uh, so we well, move forward. Well, what we have is we have, um, we have an administration that's friendly with trial lawyers uh, and has appointed people uh, to these regulatory agencies that don't necessarily believe in freedom of contract and, and even a more paternalistic approach and don't necessarily see the uh, expenses that class action proceedings can add to uh, consumers if there are not guarantees that the consumers will be treated fairly in the class action process and settlement process. Um, so you have trial lawyers lobbying very hard on one side to sort of get rid of arbitration clauses, make them illegal. Uh, mm -hmm. And on the other side, you don't really have anybody um, fighting for this because for whatever reason, the consumer protection groups, the consumers union, the public citizens are siding with the trial lawyers rather than with the consumers that they're supposed to be representing or they, they don't understand, they, they, they haven't fully contemplated um, the degree to with the way mandatory arbitration can save consumers money. Um, the banks are not going to fight very hard on the mandatory arbitration clauses because you know, if everybody is faced with the same rule, it's it's not going to be a competitive disadvantage. They'll just pass the costs of class actions along to their customers, and they have other things to fight with the the yeah. the, the the regulatory agencies about. So we we could see a, a substantial restriction in in freedom of contract as as these regulations increased, and certainly over the last few years, as as Congress has drawn the noose tighter around uh, consumer credit. And, and, and consumer banking relationships, and consumers have lost uh, some freedom of contract because certain um, fees are now illegal or, or, or uh, other consumer structures are now illegal. And, and so uh, there, there's, uh, we, we, we've sort of seen a shrinkage of um, what offers are made available to consumers and consumer credit cards. Um, certainly my cash back bonuses have, have decreased and, and uh, my the cost of my checking accounts has increased. Um, yeah. And we yeah. could see further price increases if arbitration is, is banned. Ted Frank, I wanted to thank you for uh, discussing with us today class action and abuses uh, with the system. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawtalk.org where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org.